Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is part 7 of the War of Independence series, The Knock Long Ambush. In this episode, we're returning to the story of four of the most well-known and wanted IRA volunteers in 1919. We met Seamus Robinson, Dan Breen, Sean Tracy and Sean Hogan in episode 4, where they played a central role in the Salahed Beg ambush, often considered the opening shots of the war. In the aftermath of that ambush, they spent several months on the run, but in the early months of the summer of 1919, one of the four was captured. This led to the Knock Long Ambush, a daring escape attempt which had far-reaching consequences, triggering a much wider escalation of the conflict in Tipperary that summer. Now, as you're aware, there was no podcast last week, even though an episode was due out. This is because of delays in a new mic I've bought. The current mic has been creating lots of issues and I was hoping to use that new mic for this episode. However, due to further delays, it's not going to arrive now until April the 9th. So while I am recording this episode on the older mic, the current plan is to hold off on next week's show. Then we'll hit the ground running with episode 8 on April the 19th with a new mic and hopefully the new improved sound. In the meantime, I will be flat out writing episodes, so hopefully we'll be able to catch up with the schedule through May. Thanks for your patience, and sorry about all these delays. Finally, it's worth checking out the shop after today's show. That's at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. This week, we're launching a wanted poster of Dan Breen from the War of Independence. Breen was a pretty extraordinary character, and as you'll hear, he plays a really prominent role in the following events. Additional research was by Sam McGrath. Sound was by Jason Looney. Narrations are by Aidan Crow and Therese Murray. And the artwork was by Keith Hines. Known as the Big Four, Seamus Robinson, Dan Breen, Sean Tracy and Sean Hogan had become some of the most wanted men in Ireland after the Salahed Beg ambush in January 1919. Having killed two policemen and made off with a shipment of gelignite, the authorities had put large sums of money on their heads. In the following weeks, however, they faded from public view. It had been Eamon de Valera and his daring escape from Lincoln Jail and then the general strike in Limerick that had been the focus of national and even international headlines. Meanwhile, Breen, Tracy, Hogan and Robinson had led a less glamorous existence, often in the shadows. Although heavily romanticised in later years, the reality of life on the run from the police was far from the idealised and often told tales. Evading capture was frequently a gruelling experience. They had to continuously move from house to house, never spending long in any one area. Often travelling by night, they frequently had to take long, circuitous routes, avoiding busy thoroughfares in towns where they might be recognised. Even though they took precautions, life was fraught with danger and risk. Aside from the police, every single person they encountered could potentially be the one to betray them. The police were offering a thousand pounds reward for information leading to their capture. And at the time, that was a life changing sum of money. Nevertheless, despite the fact they stayed in several houses, presumably encountering dozens, if not hundreds of people, in the five months after Salahed Beg, no one betrayed the four. However, as the weeks and months wore on, human behaviour, being what it is, resulted in a lapse of judgement that would prove so costly. By the early summer of 1919, the increasing temperatures were welcomed by the four who never knew where they would have to spend the next night. However, the shrinking hours of darkness did increase the risk of capture. In May, the four, having spent several weeks in the Clonmel area, returned towards Salahed Beg to stay with a sympathetic family, the O'Keeffe's of Clonmulty. Although always reticent to stay in any one place for any amount of time, while with the O'Keeffe's, they were convinced to stay an additional night in order to attend a dance being held in a neighbouring house. Undoubtedly, the prospect of spending a pleasant evening in the company of sympathisers was alluring and while they brought their weapons with them, it was a chance to enjoy some sense of normality. The dance itself 
that took place on Saturday, May the 10th, went on long into the evening and then the following morning, only drawing to a close at 4am. During the small hours, three of the four men, Dan Breen, Sean Tracy and Seamus Robinson, had returned to the O'Keefe's house to sleep, leaving the fourth, Sean Hogan, to make his own way back. When the dance ended, Hogan set off with Bridget and Con O'Keefe, but they decided they would first call to the O'Keefe's cousins for breakfast on their way. After being invited, Hogan decided he would join them. This would prove a fateful decision. He was now separated from his comrades and extremely tired. Indeed, on reaching the farm where he was due to have breakfast, Hogan himself was scarcely able to stay awake. Shortly after reaching the house, he was fast asleep on a sofa, only to be awoken by an unfolding crisis in the house. Six constables were spotted approaching the farm from some distance away. Hogan got up, got himself together, and he did have plenty of time to escape, so he left the house, but unfortunately, due to his unfamiliarity with his surroundings, and perhaps his wits dulled by a lack of sleep, he went in the wrong direction, heading into fields that were in full view of the road and the approaching constables. Naturally, the attention of the police was immediately drawn to this man running away from the house as they approached, and when Hogan stumbled from the field onto the road, they were waiting for him. Finding he was armed, he was immediately arrested, although initially they had no idea who he was. However, when he reached Thurless Royal Irish Constabulary Barracks, detectives there positively identified him as Sean Hogan, one of those wanted for the Solahed Beg ambush. Meanwhile, back at the O'Keefe household, where he had been due to sleep, it was the turn of Dan Breen, Sean Tracy and Seamus Robinson to be awoken by frantic news. In their case, it was the word that Sean Hogan had been arrested. The gravity of the situation was not lost on them. If brought before a court, the charge against Hogan would surely be one of murder of the policemen killed at Solahed Beg. The sentence would almost certainly be one of death. Robinson, Tracy and Breen resolved they would at least attempt to rescue Sean Hogan, although their options were limited and time was against them. In the coming days, Hogan would be moved, like all Republican prisoners in Munster at the time, to Cork City, and once there, he would be well beyond their reach. Furthermore, a raid on Thurless Barracks, where he was being held, was out of the question. It was far too well fortified. This left one option. There would be a narrow window of a few hours between the time he left Thurless Barracks and the time he arrived in Cork City. On Sunday, May the 11th, Tracy, Breen and Robinson settled on the loose outline of a plan. Hogan would be transported by train and they resolved that they would board the carriage in a quiet country station and free him at gunpoint. After considering a few stops along the line, they settled on Knocklong, a small village station over the border in County Limerick. While Tracy, Breen and Robinson travelled down to Knocklong, Republican activists began to monitor the barracks in Thurless. The Common Amon activist Mary Bridget Carey remembered how, on Tuesday, May the 13th, when they suspected Hogan was going to be moved, they were monitoring the barracks constantly. Throughout the day, the barracks was watched by an elderly lady named Mrs McCarthy, her daughter Margaret and uh, Miss Maher of Anfield, at whose house Hogan had been arrested and who'd followed the police into Thurless. They made several efforts to secure a visit to the prisoner, but without success. Mrs McCarthy at different times during the day brought fruit, tea and socks to the barracks for the prisoner, each time pleading to be allowed to see him for a few minutes but the RIC were definite in their refusal. These visits, however, provided Mrs McCarthy with the excuse which she required to remain in the vicinity of the barracks for long intervals. Eventually that evening she secured the information that Hogan was being taken to Cork by a train which left Thurless round about 6pm. Meanwhile, a team of eight IRA volunteers were assembling at Knocklong to rescue Sean Hogan. Sean Tracy, Dan Breen and Seamus Robinson were joined by five men from the neighbouring Galbally Company of the IRA. They were led by Ned O'Brien, who would play a prominent role in the following events. 
He was accompanied by four others from Galbali, who it was agreed would act as spotters. They were sent to board the train at Emily, a station up the line before Knock Long. This would give them a chance to identify where exactly Hogan was sitting, and on reaching Knock Long, they would inform the volunteers standing on the platform, who would then board the train and free Hogan. While the spotters headed off to Emily Station, Dan Breen, Seamus Robinson, Sean Tracy and Ned O'Brien made their way to Knock Long to wait for the train to arrive. However, caught somewhat off guard due to a miscommunication, Breen and Robinson were outside the station when the train appeared, leaving only Tracy and Ned O'Brien on the platform. As the train slowed down, a door swung open and one of the spotters from Galbali jumped off while it was still moving and quickly made his way to Ned O'Brien and Sean Tracy. O'Brien remembered. He whispered to me quickly. They're in the next carriage. I moved rapidly towards where Sean Tracy was and I said to him, they're in the next carriage. As Ned O'Brien recalled, Sean Tracy immediately sprung into action. He did not hesitate for a moment, but he gave the order to come. I don't know exactly what he said, or whether it was come on or I'll go. But he moved up the steps of the carriage and I followed, drawing guns as we mounted the train. Events now moved quickly. The carriage was broken into compartments, which were accessed from a corridor that ran down the left-hand side of the carriage. The constables and Sean Hogan were in the last. As O'Brien and Tracy walked down the corridor, guns drawn, passengers watched on in disbelief. On reaching the final carriage, Tracy and O'Brien opened the door and found themselves looking at Sean Hogan surrounded by three constables and a sergeant. Pointing their guns into the carriage, they instructed the handcuffed Hogan to come with them. How the policemen would react was unclear. They were armed, one with a revolver. The rest, however, had carbine rifles, which were too long and unwieldy for use in such a confined space. Ned O'Brien, who was standing alongside Sean Tracy, with their arms outstretched, pointing revolvers into the carriage, remembered, The two of us wheeled in and ordered, hands up. We had the police covered with our guns, and for a moment I thought it was going to be a bloodless victory. And then I noticed one of the RIC, the only one with a revolver, had it drawn, and was pointing it at Sean Hogan, whereupon I instinctively and immediately blazed at him, shooting him dead. At this point, a mass brawl erupted in the carriage. With one constable dead on the floor, the remaining policemen had little option but to try and fight their way out. A constable, Riley, jumped on Ned O'Brien. Another constable, Patrick Wallace, attacked Sean Tracy. In the meantime, Sean Hogan, fighting for his life, beat the third officer, a constable named Ring, with his heavy handcuffs. While this was unfolding, the four IRA spotters from Galbali, who had boarded the train at Emily, arrived in the carriage as well. They managed to take hold of a carbine rifle and used the butt to knock out one of the constables, possibly the best use of such a long weapon in a confined space. Meanwhile, a life and death struggle between Sean Tracy and the constable Patrick Wallace was taking place, with both men grappling over the policeman's revolver. The IRA volunteer John Joe O'Brien, standing over the two, drew his own revolver and pointed it at Wallace's head and fired from point-blank range but the gun misfired. It was difficult for the others to aid Sean Tracy in the chaotic, confined space of the carriage, and he now started to lose his struggle with Constable Wallace. Eventually, the policeman took control of his weapon and was able to turn it towards Tracy and pull the trigger. A shot rang out, and Sean Tracy was shot through the throat. This proved decisive, but in a most unexpected way. Perhaps it was the fear of imminent death that gave Sean Tracy the strength to wrestle control of the gun back off Wallace and despite being shot himself, he immediately shot the constable twice, killing him on the spot. This entire scene had unfolded in the space of minutes but amidst the confusion, one constable had managed to crawl out of the carriage with one of the rifles in his hand. Now standing on the platform outside the train and with space to use his weapon, he began firing at the IRA volunteers inside the carriage and bullets struck Ned O'Brien and one of the spotters, Jim Scanlon. This was now an extremely dangerous situation. But then Dan Breen and Seamus Robinson, who had been outside the station and were alerted by the sound of the shots, arrived on the platform just in time. Robinson made his way towards the engine to make sure the driver would not take off, while Dan Breen charged 
towards the constable standing on the platform. Under fire from Breen, this constable wheeled around and fired several shots, hitting Dan Breen in the arm and the chest. Remarkably, however, Breen managed to pick up his gun with the other hand and did enough to save the IRA volunteers on the train. However, blood was pouring from Breen's multiple wounds. By this point, the volunteers on the train had command of the situation and the entire party, including the handcuffed Sean Hogan, jumped onto the platform and began to make their way out of the station, leaving two policemen dead and a trail of blood from their own wounds behind them. Sean Tracy had been shot through the throat. Jim Scanlon and Ned O'Brien had sustained rifle shots while Dan Breen's condition was the most serious. He was bleeding heavily from his arm and his chest. Once out of the station, their first stop was, oddly enough, a butcher's shop. There, they used a meat cleaver to break Sean Hogan's handcuffs. From there, they managed to escape the scene to relative safety, where their wounds could be assessed. Ned O'Brien and Jim Scanlon's wounds were minor. Remarkably, Sean Tracy, who had been shot through the throat, was not seriously wounded either. The bullet had narrowly missed the arteries in his neck. Dan Breen, however, was not so lucky. A bullet had penetrated his lung and he had lost considerable amounts of blood, leaving him delirious. He was treated that night by a sympathetic doctor and again the following day by a second doctor at another safe house. Somewhat remarkably, Dan Breen did survive and this would not be the first time he would have a very close shave with death during the war. While it had come so close to ending in disaster, the rescue had in fact been a major success. While two policemen were killed, Sean Hogan had been saved from what seemed like a very certain death. For Hogan, Breen, Robinson and Tracy, their already well-established reputation now soared. While they did enjoy an almost legendary status, they had to spend the following months through the summer of 1919 on the run, roving across Munster. Meanwhile, back in Tipperary, the Republican movement came under unprecedented pressure from the authorities in the aftermath of Knock Long. Determined to smash the IRA in the county, the Royal Irish Constabulary began a prolonged and sustained campaign in Tipperary. Among those arrested in the sweeps of Republican activists was Ned Foley, one of the spotters who had boarded the train at Emily to identify where Hogan had been sitting. He was imprisoned for over two years, but in the summer of 1921, he was tried in a court-martial, along with another man, Patrick Maher. Both men were found guilty, sentenced to death and executed in Dublin. Patrick Maher had not even been present at Knock Long and was entirely innocent. Meanwhile, back in 1919, the Knock Long ambush resulted in a major escalation in the war in Tipperary that summer. As the Royal Irish Constabulary and the military authorities launched a campaign to smash all Republican organisations in the county, this would only provoke further IRA actions. And by the end of that summer, there was a growing sense the authorities were starting to lose control of the situation in Tipperary. In the aftermath of the Knock Long ambush, one of the most alarming aspects of the entire affair from the point of view of the authorities, was the reaction of the wider public. The ambush revealed a growing sympathy among the general population for the IRA. The words, knock long abu, meaning knock long forever, appeared on walls in Thurlis. Meanwhile, the constables killed were the focus of derision, not sympathy. The words, Wallace bowled over, RIP, referring to the constables shot in the struggle with Sean Tracy, was scrawled on roads. His widow was also heckled. This lack of sympathy for the Royal Irish Constabulary revealed how the force was becoming increasingly alienated from the wider population, something that the Republican movement had identified as a key strategy if they were going to win the war. However, in what would become a common feature throughout the conflict, it was the Royal Irish Constabulary who were frequently their own worst enemy, rarely stopping to ask the pertinent question as to why the wider population increasingly despised them. The answer lay in their own actions, something that was only too apparent in Tipperary that summer. To the fore of the police crackdown in the county was the Thurless District Inspector Michael Hunt. 
As they raided houses and meetings, their actions were provocative against the wider population, not only Republicans. Rather than try and isolate the IRA from the large numbers of people who had supported Sinn Féin in the 1918 election, they had, instead, begun to attack all those Republican sympathies. Inspector Hunt targeted what might be described as very soft political events, such as Eireacht, which were, in effect, community sports days organised by the Republican movement. The following report of a raid on an Eireacht in Upper Church in Tipperary that summer gives some sense of his approach. The district inspector was very active in the suppression of prohibited gatherings. Last Sunday at an Eireacht in Upper Church, about eight miles from Thurlis, he ordered the removal of a tricolour flag floating from the platform. The promoters of the Eireacht disrespected the order and the district inspector gave instructions for the police to tear it down. With the police adopting such a provocative approach, it was hardly any surprise that during the summer of 1919, growing public resentment hardened into outright hostility. This was made clear when the IRA hit back against the police in an effort to curb their campaign that had seen numerous volunteers arrested in the aftermath of Knock Long. On June the 23rd, about six weeks after Knock Long, Detective Inspector Michael Hunt, who, as we have just heard, was leading an extremely provocative campaign in Tipperary, was walking through a crowded square in Thurlis when a man walked up behind him and shot him from point-blank range. Hunt collapsed mortally wounded and died 15 minutes later. It was the reaction of the crowd that was most revealing, though. Initially, on hearing gunshots, the crowd had scattered in all directions. But then, on seeing Hunt lying on the ground, people began to crowd around him. However, those gathered refused to help the dying man or offer any succour. Instead, they jeered and laughed at him. If this wasn't bad enough, the police reaction to his shooting only increased animosity in the town. Indeed, they quickly became what was essentially an occupying force in Thurlis. For example, a newspaper report recalled the tense atmosphere in Thurlis the night Michael Hunt was shot. The police and military armed with guns and bayonets paraded through the town subsequent to the shooting. They searched several houses, ordered all public houses to close at once and clear away those on the premises. About half an hour after the event, the town was practically cleared. No arrests have been made. About nine o'clock, the remains of the inspector were removed to his own residence. The remains were covered with the Union Jack. About 50 police and 100 military marched behind the remains. Only a few civilians took part in the procession. This reaction was highly unusual in Ireland, a country where funerals tend to be very public affairs. Indeed, Michael Hunt's funeral would see what could only be described as growing passive resistance. The wider public refused to show him any respect after his death. For example, normally during funerals, shops would temporarily close as a cortege moved through the streets. The shopkeepers of Thurlis refused to do this, as this account illustrates. In Thurlis yesterday, the terrible affair was everywhere being discussed. The streets were practically deserted. There are no indications of public sympathy in the way of shops being shuttered. Indeed, even the Archbishop of Cashel, John Harty, a vocal critic of the IRA, while condemning the shooting of Inspector Hunt, pointed out the authorities themselves were partly responsible. I absolutely condemn this crime of willful murder. I cannot, however, allow it rest at that, because I see that the enemies of Ireland have used it to blacken the fair name of our country. He then continued... The government of Ireland has behind it an ugly record of provocation. Men have received long terms of imprisonment for the slightest of causes. Children have been kidnapped from their homes. Military force has supplanted government by the consent of the people. Men were imprisoned in connection with the German plot, for which, even according to the Times, there was no convincing evidence. Men were kept in prison for many weary months without a charge being preferred and without trial by their peers. Some of them died in exile. In a word, the action of this government has been highly provocative of crime. We have to thank Almighty God that so few sets of violence have been committed as a result. In the following days and weeks, the police could not find a single witness to the shooting of Detective Inspector Michael Hunt, even though it had taken place in a crowded square. Now, one would imagine 
the entire affair would have provoked some sort of review on the part of the British authorities, but instead they seem to have just doubled down. A week after the shooting of Inspector Hunt, they banned all Republican organisations in County Tipperary. This included Sinn Féin and Common Amman, the Republican Women's Organisation, but also the Gaelic League, a cultural organisation. This one-size-fits-all approach was counterproductive. Seamus Babington, a member of the 3rd Tipperary IRA Brigade, would later reflect on how the authorities had reacted to the policemen killed at the hands of the IRA. Had the British used this propaganda instead of the manhunt and the wholesale raiding and opening of the floodgates of fury, it's possible the spirit would not rekindle like it did. But with their intensive hostile action, their ruthless treatment of the civil population and their unbridled hatred of any suspects at genuine republicanism and nationalism. This open tyranny at the time was a godsend. For it engendered an amazing spirit in a section of lively young men of spirit. Although large numbers of troops arrived in Tipperary, they could not stop the IRA in the county. At the end of the summer, on September the 2nd, the 1st Tipperary Brigade, based in the north of the county, ambushed a police patrol at Laura, wounding a constable and killing a sergeant, Philip Brady. They began to turn the screw on the police in the area in the coming weeks, further isolating them from the population by targeting those who provided goods to the barracks. Less than two weeks after Sergeant Brady was killed, a horse was shot dead that had been used to deliver goods to Laura Barracks as a warning to others not to associate or aid the police. The response to these events was all too predictable. The population were further punished when gatherings including fairs and markets were banned in Tipperary. There's little doubt that through the summer of 1919, the Republican campaign to isolate the police was increasingly effective. However, it did also involve some very sinister forms of intimidation against women who dated soldiers and policemen. Although ignored by historians for decades, the targeting of these women in specifically gendered violence, often taking the form of ritual humiliation such as shaving heads and in some cases sexual assault, has come to light in recent years. The evidence for such incidents is clear in the recollections of IRA veterans from the period. Again, Seamus Babington from the 3rd Tipperary Brigade recalls the following event. A rather wild sort of young woman, a native of Kilsheelan Parish, was employed in Turner's chemist shop and, like many other girls, had a graw for men in uniform. She ignored warnings and, most dangerous at the time, used to visit the barracks after the shops closed and then proceed home. This had to be stopped, so two volunteers from the Kilsheelan end of the town were ordered to be on the road. They carried out the order, and without over-description, gave the lady a thorough searching, from head to foot, without missing any of her inside garments. It was so thorough and minute that she did dare not call to the barracks again. This was not a unique incident. Crown forces also used sexual violence as a weapon of war, something that will be explored in coming episodes. Indeed, the most intense period of the conflict was still a long way off. It is true by the end of the summer... Of 1919, large parts of Tipperary appeared increasingly out of control. However, the same could not yet be said for many other counties. Indeed, much of the country remained largely peaceful. It's in the next episode that we'll see a widening of the war. We will travel to Cork and the town of Fermoy, where the first British Army soldier killed since the 1916 Rising will die, which provokes a vicious army riot. This episode will also provide us an opportunity to look at how the IRA strategy in the war was changing in the autumn of 1919. That episode won't be out for another two weeks when hopefully I'll have the new mic. 